people would hear me okay or not? Okay. Um, come on. Right. So no fuss. Good. All right. And this isn't being filmed, is it? I can walk. I'm free to walk around. Okay. Right. Okay. Great. Move. Nice to know that. There's not much. I don't think there's anything much more painful than watching me stand in one place for 45 minutes. Or is it 50? Well, 45 minutes. Trying to keep you on time. Um, two things. I've been told I have an accent. Yes, you know I'm naturally Canadian. Well, I've got that Canadian passport as well as my European passport, soon to be British passport, and my Australian passport. Um, so my parents sometimes say, so which passport are you travelling on this time, United Nations? Um, the other thing is, if I say anything, so with my accent, if I say anything you don't quite catch, please don't hesitate to you know, ask me to repeat it. The other thing is, if I, I'd like to make this somewhat interactive. Um, so if I say anything you don't agree with, challenge me. I'm a big boy. Um, I'm getting a bit too big, which I need to do something about. So don't be afraid to challenge me, okay? Or if you want me to go into any great, with greater detail. I've only got 120 slides to go through. But I've got about 25, actually. But anyway, and... So, so long as we keep to time and you get something out of this session, because it's your session, you're taking your time to come here. So, that's my aim. It's not about me hearing my own voice, it's about what value you can get from it. And I hope that I help shape some of your thinking in whatever discipline that you're currently studying. Over time, I have become to feel like a Boiled frog. Who's familiar with the boiled frog syndrome? You put a boiling frog in hot water, what's it going to do? It's going to jump out immediately. It's going to be burned, but it'll jump out. You put a frog in cold water and turn up the heat, and it'll think, ah, oh, nice and lovely. Swim around, do some, you know, get used to it. But, be, but it will ultimately stay there until it's boiled to death. I have to come to feel like that. And I'm really concerned about the long-term implications of our food and agricultural system on the environment. And I don't want to be alarmist by, by saying that, but it really concerns me. And I'll show you some numbers that go to the heart of what's become a passion for me. So, starting off briefly, um, Harwinger kindly introduced me, and thank you for, for Harwinger and Valerie and um, sorry, I forget the, the other uh, organising committee's names, but thank you for inviting me to present. Um, it's nice when I get an opportunity to pay something back. Um, so we're an international team. We have, in, we have experts who have uh, experience in multiple industries. My primary career has been agriculture and food. I've worked along entire, virtually the entire chain. Um, and I certainly work with the entire chain. Uh, some of our team come from varying backgrounds, like aerospace, automotive, and sometimes, like one of the, our key team is a guy by the name of Dan Laplain, and he's primarily automotive and aeronautical backgrounds. And some of the questions he asks when we're talking to people and doing projects, I'm thinking, oh crap, why did he ask that? But because he asks some of the most basic, fundamental questions, the responses he gets are just insightful because he brings a new perspective to it. And I think, if anything, in agriculture, we need to bring new perspective to what we do. Else we're all going to become build, boiled frogs at some point. We've completed over 2,000 projects, the team as a whole. So I think we're pretty experienced. But we're always learning. Uh, Harwinger mentioned that uh, in 2014 we released a paper called $27 Billion Revisited. Um, in January the 17th we're going to be releasing new figures and it, I think some of the insights will hopefully get attention. Because we've looked at whole, the food loss and waste from a whole of chain perspective. From production through to post-consumer. There, all those, uh, those reports are more available on our website. But one of the things I keep coming back to 
And this was, when you walked into my PhD professor's office, this statement smacked you in the face. You could not miss it. For every complex problem, there is a solution that is simple, neat, and wrong. And how often do we hear someone think or, or write or in the media, they come up with a solution that sounds really good. But when you start critically investigating it, thinking about it, totally out for lunch. Such as the media continually says, oh, consumers, you're the ones who drive freeways. You're the naughty people. Well, we're all consumers. But I would argue, and I'll show partly why, that the loss that occurs in the, in the home among consumers is partly a manifestation of how the wider industry operates. So yes, there's a lot of waste in, uh, public in the home. And sorry, I forgot to say. Molly. Molly's going to talk later on about uh, consumer waste. And I might going to talk about food waste too. Um, so it is, a, it is a real challenge. We need to be more responsible about what we buy, how we consume it, how, how we behave with it. But it's not the end of the problem. This is tomatoes. What's more ubiquitous than a potato? Sorry, potato? Tomato. Hello? Sorry, I'm, I'm new to this agriculture game. Um, so a tomato. Growing perfectly on the vine. That, I'm not sure there's a pointer here. This picture here is tomatoes grown on the ground because they've been grown without a market. Because either a retailer has changed their orders, they don't make specifications, and there's simply not a market for it. Hundreds of tons, literally just thrown on the ground. This is from one of our uh, team's work in Africa. Transporting tomatoes in wooden boxes. Considerable waste because they're simply in wooden boxes. And you know what? We have to get so many tomatoes, the same as we, we found doing in mangoes. We need to get so, as many potato, uh, tomatoes as we possibly can in this container. So what do we do? We push them in. Because we're the logistics people. We're concerned about moving as much product as possible and how we reduce our prices because we get volume in there. But we don't think because we don't pay for it, because we're just the logistics people, we don't pay for the waste. Because that's the poor bugger, that's the, the person that pays for that is the poor bugger that produced it. So we don't connect the dots. We did a project, uh, one of our, some of our team did a project in Pakistan in mangoes. Big crates. So a larger version of that. There were people literally jumping on the crates to close the lid. Mangoes don't like people jumping on them. Then in the retail store, waste there, whether it be from us feeling it to see if it's ready or not, or just, oh, I've got a blemish on that. Ooh, that's nice. Um, then when we cook it, we might prepare too much. And then whatever we don't use goes in the bin. We need to look at things from a holistic value chain perspective. And there's the economic, the social, and the environmental reasons. We've, as a country, have signed up to the UNDP's sustainability goals, which says we're going to reduce waste in the house, house by 50%. We're going to reduce the waste along the chain, but that's too big a nut to crack, so we won't actually put a target on that. It kind of seems a little bit bizarre, but... Um, Historically, we have connected, we have coupled um, development with waste, unknowingly. The more we've increased the, in the industry, the more we've sought to in uh, address one link in the chain at a time, that indirectly has driven waste. There's a chart that I was going to include, uh, um, and I'm happy to share with you, it's from a report that Ralph Martin, myself, and uh, uh, another lady wrote, and we historically looked at food loss and waste in Canada. And it is an upward trend. It has been for decades. We're not getting better. We're actually worse than we were. Um, and our lifestyles are just totally unsustainable. Um, at dinner last night, I mentioned to someone about carrying capacity. 
if you haven't, if you're not aware of carrying capacity, just look it up. Um, there's a fascinating documentary by David Attenborough that he goes into this. And carry, uh, the benchmark for carrying capacity is someone is considered to be living sustainably, a sustainable you know, lifestyle, when you use two hectares, around two hectares of land to supply our needs, provide our needs. That's the benchmark they use to see how sustainable a lifestyle is. North American lifestyle, we are nine times that of India. We, are, we, we consume nine, over nine times the resources that they do in India per person, per capita. That is totally unsustainable. How can we possibly continue that? particularly with a, a burgeoning population. Social impact. In Canada, we have one in eight households that are food insecure. In a country such as this, when we waste enormous amounts of food, there's over a million people, almost one and a half million people, who don't have enough food. That is, that is socially irresponsible. And we've got more overweight people in the world than we have malnourished. So I argue we need to take a whole of chain approach. We need to look at things from a whole of chain perspective because it gives us insights that we otherwise wouldn't have. These figures are from a project that we completed a couple of years ago and I thought about talking about this uh, today and giving its experience, but it's a case study on our website. So, um, so let's say, for example, waste along a chain. This is peaches, Ontario-grown peaches. Talk about local food to reduce waste, blah, blah, blah. Well, let's say on the harvest, 20% of the peaches that are grown aren't harvested, whether it be because a retailer has changed their orders, whether it be that the, they, weren't, didn't, uh, they weren't considered to be ready before they finished picking that particular part of the orchard, whatever reason. And then you say that 30% of what's picked is graded out, doesn't get to market. Again, because it could be someone changing their orders, uh, it could be too much inventory, so the quality's going downhill before it's shipped. Uh, could be a number of reasons. In distribution, so through the actual supply chain, once the peaches have left the, the, vin the storage, the grading warehouse, um, in the retail store, or in the, in, uh, then there's 10%, an extra 10% loss. And then in the home, the consumer eats three quarters what they buy which what we found is actually conservative. How many of us have picked up a, bought a, a litre of, a, sorry, three, three litres of peaches and not eaten half of them? Or you found that by the time you get to them, they've, 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 they've started decomposing, they've gone into self-destruct mode um, from the inside because they haven't been treated correctly or harvested at the right time. If we start off with 100 tonnes, that's grown in a field that's good product. How much does that equate to of that that's actually consumed? Who's doing statistics? Any guesses? 38%. We have lost 62% of what we grow. And that is not unusual, I'm afraid. Some colleagues of ours did work in Europe on strawberries, and they found that 75% of the product can be lost before it's even close to ripening. We our industry is so inefficient at times; it defies belief. People from other industries look at us and they say, "How can you continue like this?" So why are we so inefficient? when the opportunities are staring us in the face. A report we did in 2014, I think, we, we, we estimated that if we improve the feed conversion ratio of, the, of Canada's cattle industry, that would translate to a million tons less of grain required to produce the same amount of meat. And that half a unit of improved feed conversion is nothing. It's perfectly achievable. 
one of the reasons being we, 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 we breed cattle, we produce cattle in ways that the, if you look at it from a autumn, or like a manufacturing perspective, it just doesn't make sense because there's so many inefficiencies. The key reason for that is we look at our system in isolation. Businesses operate in isolation, both between themselves and within themselves. So our systems are organised vertically. We have a VP of operations or a VP of procurement and a VP of merchandising and a VP of marketing. And how often do they talk to each other? And one is actually benefits by playing off the other one. That leads to, in, to, in, to challenges, adversity within a business. You multiply that along the chain and you get this bullwhip effect, which we've known about since the 1950s, and the food industry is still since the 1990s. We <coughs> in recognising what the bullwhip effect does in terms of profitability and sustainability and effectiveness. Because we're so vertically focused. Yet the processes that determine how sustainable we are, how efficient we are, are horizontal. And the reason we look, we, we learn so much from businesses such as Toyota is because they balance this. And there's a few about 10 years ago when they lost that balance. And what happened to them? They went through a real challenging period because they become, for a moment, they become more vertically focused and horizontal focused. So even businesses that have got this damn pat, if they lose, lost, lose, if they take their eye off the ball, even they are challenged. But when you don't even consider this balance, the opportunities can be dramatic. And because we're so focused vertically on our own little fiefdoms, we totally forget about mum, dad, and Joey. It's like the consumer's an afterthought. And that comes to our industry is primarily look at how do we produce something? How do we, 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 we produce it, we batch it, we store it? And that leads to enormous losses. It means it ties up enormous amounts of capital. And we're decades behind other industries in, look, in, in applying approaches such as lean. And it, a evidence of that, an example of that, is our reliance as an industry on encouraging consumers to buy more cheaply because we're pushing product through the system. And 2000, I think it was a 2014 report. This was a gentleman, uh, this quote is from a gentleman who remains anonymous because he's, we he's well known in the industry. He's worked for retail, he's worked for suspender, and he's worked in the, a couple of other um, positions in the food industry. And this is his quote. Consumers are picking off deals while retailers and suppliers are picking off each other. And ultimately, that leads to us not valuing food and it leads to enormous amounts of waste. So we look at loss, waste, sustainability as an outcome. It's an outcome of, of how the processes currently work. But the good news is we found over the years that not all businesses are the same. When we first, our first report, 2010, was titled Food Waste in Canada. And we never thought it would get anywhere near the attention it did. It's been quoted, it's been referenced, uh, last time I heard, it was over 200,000 times. When we wrote it, we thought this is a, just a natural progression of our previous work in how do you extract inefficiencies from the chain. But it caught people's attention in ways we'd never envisaged. And one of how that started was the fact we realized that through our work, research, and with industry, is that the businesses that are more collaborative, the businesses that have broken down these silos, have more consistent margins, are more innovative, and they have less waste. And they have less waste because then they've broken down the silos, because they're innovative. It's an outcome. And we, over the years, we've, we, we've categorized, you could actually, literally like a doctor, identifying 
what, what, you, what your health issue is, you can diagnose how the, the state of a chain. There's certain indicators you can use, and you can categorize them. And that will give you an idea as to where to look for where the opportunities are, and what's the scale of opportunity, and what are the root causes. And I'm going to talk in, in uh, a moment, which is briefly mentioned, two collaborative chains, one of which I had the pleasure of working for. So, in summary so far, creating a sustainable food industry rests in part on addressing losses and waste. Because one of the reasons being, let's say, uh, whatever product you lose, you also lose an enormous number of associated waste that have more value, often have more value in the product itself. We worked with a distributor for a project uh, last year. They were astonished to find that the true cost of their shrink was over five times the value of the actual product. And when you identify the root causes of loss and waste, you, you, you totally you look to solve many other issues across the business. The sustainability of the present food industry is questionable. And we can group value chains into four, into four typologies. So to get that change, we need to change behavior. And we need to do that one step at a time. So how do we improve it? When we look at a business, when we look at a chain, we look at it through the lens of it being a system with subsystems. The three subsystems we look at are products and technology. What's the physical? Both in terms of the product that's produced or transformed, what's the technology used in that production or transformation? Whether that be variety in terms of the seeds, the genetics, whether it be in terms of the sprays used, whether it be in the infrastructure used in producing it and shipping it, and the technology in terms of the, the, the milling process or the um, uh, food manufacturing process, whether it be the cool chain. The other one is information and communication. Who communicates what? What information is shared? What information isn't shared? How is it communica information communicated? One of the things we find time after time is it's not issues are not down to a lack of information. It's a lack of the right information. We worked with a, with a lady in Manitoba who came, she'd been, she'd been up most of the night trying to get all her records up to date. And she came in, I think it was about 36 things, 36 metrics she was measuring. At the end of the day, we realized she actually needed to measure six. There were six things needed to measure. How many of those six was she actually measuring? Two. She was measuring 34 things that were literally noise. And she wasn't measuring four of the things that she really needed to measure. Still there's governance. Who's making what decisions where? How are they, why are they, what incentivizes them to make those decisions? Is it contract? Is it financial penalty? If you're a vendor to a retailer, any retailer, sorry. Um, if you're a retailer, uh, great people work for retailers, don't get me wrong. If you're supplying a retailer and you, you're long on product, you've got too much, or more importantly, they've got too much, what will they do? They'll cancel your order. Without hesitation. You're stuck with product. No recall, unless you can find a market for it, and if you can, it's going to be a second market. If you're short of product, what does the retailer do? They will invariably penalize you. So you lose on both counts. That is the kind of governance that we mentioned. And that's not being, being critical to retailers. It's just how the system operates. But we know the retailers that have, and we can show you examples, the retailers have closer relationships functional relationships with the rest of the chain, make greater margins, and have greater overall financial performance. So it's about achieving more with less. 
This is an example because, of course, we can't show you the specifics of what we've done with the business in a matter of weeks. So let's say, this is a, as all of you, I imagine, are familiar with a bell-shaped curve in terms of where loss and waste is, and we've separated this into where loss and waste occurs, utility grade, so that's very basic. That's literally commodity. Commodity grade, so that's the average grade, and then premium grade. And you see there's, a, there's quite a bit of waste and there's hardly any premium grade. Let's redraw the bell-shaped curve by pushing it up, by in put in putting in processes that lead to better, more consistent quality, that lead to less waste, that lead to greater uh, opportunity to increase revenue. And I'll give you a specific example in French fries in a moment. But we have great opportunity to shift that curve, to redesign it with less. We can get greater outcomes with the use of fewer resources. And I'll use two specific examples. One of which that I had the pleasure of working for, I had a, learned an enormous amount. And another one in, they operates in the UK and they're steadily expanding around the world in beef. So I had two, two initiatives that have succeeded which I think will have set the benchmark for what's possible. They, they didn't go out there and, and be, accept the dysfunctionality, the issues that come along with dysfunctional systems. They purposely set out to redesign the system. What do we want to achieve and how do we achieve it? And therefore, what does that mean for how we operate, how our vendors operate, how our customers operate, how we interact with them? In, the, in both, they've literally, part of their, their success, their recipe for success, is developing a correct group, a group of strategically aligned businesses. They consider every stage of production a process. And they map it. They've mapped it and they, they identify, okay, we're going to measure this here, we're going to measure that there, and we're going to et cetera, et cetera, and then we're going to correlate the results to identify patterns, trends. They manage root cause and effect. They map root cause. What happened here? What's the cause of it? Now how do we address it? And then we use our measurement process to monitor performance. They clearly design protocols. This is what you will do. And if you don't do it, you, this is the penalty. But we're not going to suddenly throw you under a bus because you've done something you don't realize is right. But at the same time, if you do something that's right, we will reward you. I remember um, Dave Price from uh, Sunterra in Alberta said, one of the reasons they bought a processing plant because the only thing you ever heard from the processor was what they didn't want. Provide, they provide financial and technical reports, whether that be agro agronomic, whether it be uh, animal science, so vet, they provide price commitment to farmers. If you do this, this is the price we will give you. We're not producing a commodity and therefore we're not subject to the commodity pricing, which seems to be a, the Achilles heel for, many, for much of the industry. And they may take ownership of the product twice along the chain. And I'll so the first one is blade farming. We've got a case study, actually a case study on both of these chains on a our website. Blade farming for me is fascinating. This guy, Richard Phelps decided he wanted to do something different in beef. He was con convinced you could produce beef more, more efficiently and effectively than the industry was doing. So he looked for examples, and he couldn't find any in, any in agriculture. He had this idea. So he actually looked, started looking to the, to the automotive industry. And then he literally, blade farming produces, processes, and markets beef using the same techniques and tools that Toyota uses to produce and market cars. And it's phenomenally efficient compared to the wider beef industry. 
the gentleman there with his daughter-in-law, Mr. Tudor, um, well, first time I had any interaction, physical interaction uh, in, with Richard, they took me to his farm. And, and, and this Mr. Tudor, he said, I, I battled. I didn't want to, I wanted to join blade farming, but I didn't want to follow their processes because they were different to what I'd done in the past. And he said, and then he turned around uh, to me and he said, it's the best financial decision I've made in my life. And this is a guy in his 70s. Those are cattle being finished. The right-hand photograph, you could put a ruler across them. Uh, Paul Westerway is the name of the farmer who's, whose farm they're on. He sent 50 animals to, for processing in one lot. There was half a kilo difference in their weight across 50 animals. These are Richard's quotes. If there's any grey area in a chain, it will fail because of waste and therefore unsustainability. He doesn't even step foot onto someone's farm unless they have the cattle that they're looking for. We're not interested in if they're the best farmer. We're interested in whether or not they want to learn. Um, to give you an idea of the efficiencies they've achieved, their pharmaceutical and medical costs are at average 80% less than the wide, a typical farmer in the wider industry. That itself is an enormous saving. The feed cost savings are enormous. Um, and part of the way they've done that is they've established this correct truth with, with their feed suppliers. As in, every, every three months, they have a vet who's, who's contracted to them, not to put fires out, to protect issues, from, to help prevent issues from arising. So everything, part of what they do is to continually to, to prevent issues, fires, whether it be health issues, feed conversion issues, um, mortality issues from arising. And so an example is, in the widest, what, what would be a typical calf mortality rate here in Ontario. Who's anyone? <laughs> Someone is saying there was people doing meat or meat science. So yeah, okay, fine. Okay, let's say it's like four percent or five percent, or it could be more. Theirs is is, is essentially one percent. They've reduced the mortality by you know five or six fold. They've also improved the feed conversion ratio. So you get animals finishing quicker, using less resources, which means you have less environmental impact. It costs less. So they've markedly re reduced the time it takes to produce an animal and the feed you have to put into the animal to finish it. And the quality of the meat is so much better than a typical, uh, the, the typical beef industry. If anyone's been to Britain, you know that beef isn't often that good anyway. Um, so it's just an example of what can occur. And their level of strategic alignment is such that uh, they were bought by ABP, a large processor, because Sainsbury's had gone to them, to ABP, and said, we want you to become our dedicated beef and veal supplier. That meant, okay, late farming now is to get into the veal industry, which essentially it was doing, but it wasn't doing you know, formally, because it, it was selling finished beef. And so, it, 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 because it needed added milk powder, it became the, the UK's largest purchaser of milk powder. That meant they got volume discounts. They went to Mole Valley farmers and said, Valerie, your Mole Valley farmers, which Valerie? No, Avery, oh, sorry, Avery, your Mole Valley farmers, okay? We, we've got these volume discounts. We want you to supply our farmers on when they need it at the cost of providing it. But we will give you our volume discount for whoever you sell your milk to, the milk to. We don't care what you sell this powdered milk to for other people. You can charge them the world, but you just make sure you, you do the right thing by us by having the product to our farmers when they need it. And we'll tell you in advance. 
That's the kind of relationship they have with their, with their partners. Where they started with Mole Valley Farmers, they said to them, we will help you reduce costs by amortizing your systems, your infrastructure, better. When's the typical time that a farmer orders feed? It's on a Friday as they're going into the weekend and they think, oh crap, I haven't got enough feed to get me through to Monday. Or it's on a Monday because they've just scraped through. So one of the early uh, things that uh, Richard did with Mole Valley is we will order food from you on a, a feed on a Tuesday, a Wednesday, or a Thursday. If we order it on a Monday or a Friday, it's our fault, and therefore we will, we will, we will pay whatever penalties we need to. There's a level of decision making and monitoring and improvement. And we've got a video case study on that. It's, it's just, I found it was fascinating. Perfection fresh. I just finished my master's looking at value at supply chain management. Actually, I hadn't just finished it, I was in the process of finishing my thesis. And uh, Michael Simonetta, a second from the left, who's the CEO, said, OK, Martin, you've studied this stuff, now come and do it. I thought, crap. <laughs> it's so much easier writing. Um, but I learned so much. Michael is a visionary. He's a true visionary of what can, what can be achieved. He comes from an accounting background, so it's all about dollars and cents. These are his quotes. And they've literally applied exactly the same as Blade Farming. They've applied process improvement, lean six sigma approaches to strip waste out of the system and get consistent quality. We didn't realize, this. so in January 2001, I was standing in a room, probably about two thirds the size of this, in front of, actually it'd be half the size of this, in front of producers, uh, a key retailer, telling them about this initiative we're going to launch. And we put a lot of thought into it. We had the seed right. Um, this is what we're going to do. This is what everyone needs to do to make it a success. This was our vision. We never in our wildest dreams, never imagined that within 18 months, we would get awarded the international prize for the world's best new fruit and vegetable product of 2002. What we had was process. It was process, process, process. Because when you have processes, you know what's going to happen, you know what should happen, and you can measure performance against it. It wasn't the fact we had the best variety in the world. It's the fact we understood what needed to happen, and we engaged everyone in making sure it happened. So, particular story. I know I'm kind of, sort of watching time. Every eight months, there about six to, six to eight months, we had a supply chain meeting. We brought people from across Australia, the main growers, the seed company, the agronomist, the retailer, ourselves, the marketing company. And Michael said one time, he said, how is it, and Michael loved eating the fruit and vegetables he walked around our warehouses, he said, how is it that I can have two clamshells of tomatoes, great tomatoes, side by, and one of them tastes really nice, and the other one tastes not so nice. You can put it in slightly more eloquent words. Um, and you're both using the same variety of seed. How do you get discussion amongst farmers? Tell them that one is doing a better job than the other one. Immediately went into a conversation, quite a, you know, not a heated, but yeah, somewhat heated conversation about what was going on. And then with some, a farmer made a totally off the cuff comment. Oh, well, we, we can't get because you know, they're hard to train, they move on before they're trained, it takes so long to train them, so we really don't bother training them. Um, and they pick tomatoes too early, and so we put them in the back of the shed to wait till they turn the right color, and then we reintroduce them on the packing line, and hey presto, they go to market. What do you need to know about tomatoes? Why do fine ripened tomatoes taste so good? Well, a typical tomato you buy in the stores tastes so cardboardy because a tomato never changes its taste from the moment it's picked. It will change color, it will not change taste. So what Michael had was one essentially vine ripened tomato, a clamshell of vine ripened tomato, another clamshell of green tomatoes that had turned red. Hey presto, how do we fix that? 
literally another 10 minutes of discussion, and we had the solution to it. And what totally blew me away is our QA guy actually went a step further and said, you know, if we do that, we can do this, and we can do that, 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 that. That was literally a half hour discussion. And that revolutionized the project. So I'm going to rush, run through these slides because I don't want to hold the um, mic up um, or bore you. Um, so this is our approach to analyzing chain. We, look, we start by mapping the chain, looking at whatever consumer uh, information exists. We analyze the chain, measure performance. And we diagnose the state, propose what the new procedure would look like, cause and effect, what are the root causes, what's causing what to occur and why, prioritizing action, what's going to get us the greatest results in the best, the shortest space of time and offers the least risk. And then implementation. Little by little, step at a time. These case studies are available on our website showing that the system works. In terms of the mainline distributor I mentioned about, $1.2 million of opportunities, which they were grabbing within a matter of a week or so, and not that's just in relation to loss. It's not in relation to any of the larger inefficiencies that we found in the same, at the same time. Capturing across the business. Converting potatoes into French fries. Well, how difficult is it to convert a potato into a French fry? Well, it starts with a potato. So, this is where we say, if you look at one part of the chain, it can be really challenging, or really exciting, the other current changes you can get in the, along the same point. There is an assumption that, so this, a challenge facing this French fry manufacturer was that they were, their grades in terms of what their customers were looking for was not good enough given the volume of potatoes they were processing. That, so, and there is an automatic assumption that large potato mean, or long, you get long French fries and large potatoes. They had not actually measured it, they had not analyzed it, that was actually the case. So, through a series of designs of experiment, we actually found that no, large potatoes actually produce terrific hash browns which are worth a fraction of French fries. As well, if you actually get the right variety of potatoes, which take less inputs at the farming level, so it costs farmers less to produce, it also means they have a shorter production cycle, which means they can get a winter crop in, uh, in rather than to wait for a spring crop, which translates to less environmental runoff. It, it, it equates to less, um, less irrigation, less fertilizer and to be used for the same to produce the same crop is actually now worth more. There's benefits on the farm. There's benefits in terms of, you get the right potatoes, which we found was actually the size of a Coke can with high internal solids, that reduces the oil re required to produce the French fries, reduces the energy required to heat the oil to produce the French fries, as well as multiple knock-on effects. And because they're producing these French fries so much more efficiently, the workers, now have a four-day week. Every, they have a long weekend every week. If I'm a worker, wow, I get the same money for working four days. If we have to come in on that fifth day, it's because an issue has, has occurred or there's, a, there's an emergency order or something. So, conclusion. So what, what would I like to, you know, hope you take away? Food loss and waste is, 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 a, is a key part of achieving a more sustainable industry. Whether that's the waste of the product or it's the associated waste, whether it be fertilizer, irrigation water, machinery wear, etc. It makes sound business and economic sense. We, we work in an industry typified by tiny margins. One reason for those small margins is the amount of inefficiency. The inefficiencies invariably, to some degree, come from the adversity, the adversarial relationship. 
business systems determine the behavior of the people involved. And they also are manifest in, in, in how us as consumers behave to a degree. Attitude is the key ingredient. It's not having the most, the cheapest resources. It's not having the cheapest inputs. It's not having the cheapest products. It's not about screwing your supplier so you can get one extra cent. It's about the attitude and wanting to learn. And the more you can learn as a chain from multiple businesses working together, learning together, the more you can compete. And the more opportunity you have. You know, one of the most exciting things for me is seeing people change, seeing people realize these opportunities. And don't and don't and always invest in finding out what those opportunities are and how to 